before we went to bed that night, we had a pretty good idea that the day was coming. You could hear helicopters flying around all morning, and you knew that it was coming. Word come down quite early that there was a lot of mobilization happening. You could see the lineups of police buses, and uh, I remember seeing the military greens coming up the sides and they had very scary guns and uh, these dogs. The dogs were just always like pulling at the leashes and barking and snarling. And I remember the RCMP marching towards us in formation. I couldn't really make out what they were saying, but they were chanting something together and then they all went <gasps> like that. And I just felt like, wow, they are ready to attack. It's almost laughable the the, the level of expense the state is willing to go through in order to, you know, inflict that bit of fear and intimidation on our people. To see that level of, uh, of police force used on, you know, eight people standing on a bridge was extreme to say the least. When you see a wall of fear, intimidation, violence marching towards you and the people that you love, there's this moment where you make a decision. Am I going to stand up or am I going to, you know, go run and hide? Uncle Lawrence standing there with, it, with his wife, like, you know, like those are beautiful moments of resistance. Like, how can you not love that? How can you not respect that? I don't even know what it is, the will, I guess, to, to stand there against such a wall of hate and, and oppression and racism. They just broke right through us, and uh, we just wrapped around Auntie Janet, this elder, and we just all did this big bear hug and started to sing. And we sang the Mohawk Water song by Bear Fox. You hear from all the fucking governments across the country talking about, you know, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls or Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. Like, you know, you hear all this happy Indian rhetoric from all these politicians and you know, all the things that we're gonna do to make these big changes and, you know, and then you, you see exactly in those moments just how serious they are about reconciliation. And it seemed pleasurable to them. They went right after the men first, my brother and Skylar. And me and Logan just held on to each other. We get beat up for 30 seconds and slammed to the ground with cops on top of us. Seeing my brother ripped off and, you know, grabbed by his braids, them just jumping on top of him, slamming him down, and uh, his legs kind of bent back in a weird shape, and, you know, he's yelling, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. The cop is kneeing me in the ribs and uh, finally got my hands out and, and arrested me uh, and put me in cuffs. When I was finally arrested, it still sits with me, so he put me in the back of his car, my arms behind my back, shaking, and this police officer winks at me. And it continued, you know, that feeling of not being valued or respected uh, throughout jail, throughout the court system. I expect, I guess, to be, be treated a bit different. You know, I've, you know, stood on many a front line and, and pushed back as hard as I could in my life, but like, for like Logan and Layla who'd never, like they've never been arrested for anything. And then when we're transported to court, it's a day that I'll never forget, my first ever appearance in court. Stripped down to my underwear, my long johns, uh, very exposed um, and shackled by my ankles, shackled by my wrists. I remember getting up to go to court that morning. I reached for my clothes and the guy said, oh, no, no, just your boots. I'm not going to court in my underwear. And he's like, your stuff's gonna go with you, it'll be ready for you when you get there. So then when we were taken to the court, there were these SUV transport trucks. And in the back hatch, it was all metal, everything was metal. They were like these two dog cages, looked like dog cages. You know, the large kind of like three feet deep, three feet tall and two feet wide dog cages wrapped in plexiglass and kind of like bolted and well secured. I got to the back and he said, all right, hop on in. And I said, no, fuck that. I ain't going in a fucking dog cage. 
He said, well, there's 15 other people behind you. And the judge said they only got an hour for court. So if you want to hold everybody up, you're more than welcome to it. And so I bit my tongue. I bit my tongue and I stepped up to the bumper of this SUV and shimmied my way into the back of this little dog crate in the back of this SUV. That feeling of that hatch closing and just being in darkness. And again, you don't know where you're going. You're just going wherever you're told. And there's this sense of control and dominance. You know, it's just like this degrading feeling of humiliation. That was a hard 10 minute ride. We got taken up to the courtroom. I stopped and I'm like, well, where's my bag? I'd like to put, you know, I'd like to put my clothes on. I'm not going to court in my underwear. Like, give me my pants. And the one officer said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get you your stuff when you're ready for it. It was only my brother and Skylar and myself that were in these ankle shackles. An extra level of degradation that they wanted to push on, on the three Mohawks that were, that were dragged in front of that courtroom that day. And the other girls that were in the room with me that were, they weren't Indigenous. Some of them didn't even have uh, handcuffs on. As you're walking through the, the, you know, all of these doors and trying not to trip over the chain that's between your ankles, you know, looking down, all you seen was that the floor changed, changed from concrete to this red carpet. And I just remember seeing a wall of faces, community members, law enforcement, officials, uh, just people I didn't know. And I just felt like, I felt like such a criminal. I know that what I'm doing is right, but I feel like a criminal. I, it, it was a hard feeling to explain, like you, you were less than. They walked us across the front of the courtroom in our shackles and underwear, and it took me a second to try and put together just how wrong everything was. People in the movement, we always talk about like the crown representing you know, the state and violence and, you know, supporting the corporations. But like, when it's a civil arrest, a lawyer arguing for your detainment, a person arguing against your bail and setting conditions isn't the Crown, it's the lawyer for CGL. And the judge is the Superior Court judge that granted the injunction who is pissed off that we violated her injunction in the first place. You know, you get a taste of how Indigenous people have felt criminalized and how they do feel criminalized in that system. Just a taste. And it was enough for me to realize that something is very wrong. It is such a commonplace across every single Indigenous movement that you see is you see this, this bit of paper that come from these civil courts that are, are being utilized as tools of that oppression, of that dispossession of Indigenous people across the country. And you know, you see people be beaten, you see people dragged from their lands, you see like attack dogs at the ready and AR-15s with their finger on the trigger and like, you know, this is, this is fucking 2021. Like this isn't fucking 1921. As you come home, things are different. It affects you. We were at a rally and I just I saw like police cherries behind us. And I just remember this, like, I felt like I couldn't move. And in that moment, I was like, this is exactly what they had intended for me to see a police officer and be triggered by fear. That was intentional. And you know what? It's a fucking 500 year old song and dance now and I think, most of our communities are onto it and we know what it is. I know that a lot of our friends there are dealing with trauma. You know, that it's really hard to continue to stand up when you have been terrorized in that way. But that's what makes us warriors. That's what makes us different. After being 100 kilometers from anything that looks like concrete and asphalt, it's a bit of an adjustment to come back. I mean, my river at home, like, we don't let our kids swim in it, let alone eat anything out of it or drink it. You're more likely to catch a shopping cart from No Frills or a 1978 BMX bike than a, than a salmon out of our river. You know, there, there's many of us that never have and maybe never will drink from a clean river. I've been to many different reserves and talked to them about their water issues, their boil water advisories, the fight for water that is going on all across Turtle Island. And I've seen 
rivers poisoned. I've seen rivers filled with dead salmon. I've seen people shed real tears for the destruction of their lands that they're connected to. This is why it's not just about the Wet'suwet'en people. It's about all of us, because water is life for all of us. And so whatever we can do to support, whatever we can do to amplify, whether that's boots on the ground, shoulder to shoulder, you know what, these injunctions are just bits of paper. If they want to jail us, jail me for standing up for that, and they want to sick the attack dogs and AR-15s on us, like they're, they're more than welcome to do that, but it isn't going to stop us. This connection that we have to the land around us, the land that we've, we've lived on, our territories, it is real. And we know what that feels like as Haudenosaunee. We feel that connection because it's not just nature. We are in a relationship with that land. It knows us and we know it. As you know, like we always talk about this connection that we have to each other and this connection that we have to the land and the water. And you know what, that means something for us. And so whatever that takes to stand with our brothers and sisters on the West Coast, like we're gonna be there 100%.